title, Bait Yourself. It was kind of a hybrid. I came up with this title. Um, the idea being the Beatitudes, um, there's eight of them, all right? So that's where I got Bait Yourself. And then I like the idea because Jesus gave us these eight attitudes of how we're supposed to be as Christians and live. And he kind of changed the whole uh, society, the whole culture. It was these eight statements that we're going to be going over the next, going through over the next four weeks were countercultural to that day. And I believe they're still countercultural to us today. And so this idea of baiting yourself would be that as you apply these to your life, you become attractive to those who don't know God and don't know Jesus, and they see something different in you, and then you're able to tell them what it is that's different in you. So we want to be a people that exemplify these eight attitudes, which are called the Beatitudes, all right? So that's kind of the idea, and so we're going to be going over, the, we're going to be going through two Beatitudes a week uh, starting today for the next four weeks. Um, so I, before we jump in here, I, I want to ask you guys a question. How many of you have ever been somewhere exotic like Fresno? Um, and, and you guys ever been anywhere exotic? Okay, Fresno is not very exotic. It's cool, though. Well, I'm down with Fresno. Um, the armpit of California. No, I think that's what they call Merced. I don't know. Um, so how many have ever been on a trip for a conference of some sort? Anybody in here ever been to, like, for work or school or spiritual reasons? Come on, put your hand up. Have you ever been to a conference? All right. So pretty much everyone in here can raise their hand saying, yes, I've been to a conference of some sort at some time in my life. And every time you go to a conference, you go expecting something, don't you? You go expecting to get something out of it. I mean, you go to a conference thinking, I'm going to learn something about my job, my craft. I'm going to get better at it. Uh, maybe I'm going to grow spiritually if it's a spiritual conference. Uh, but you go to these conferences, and, and we all do at some time in our life usually, um, because we want, we're expecting something. We're expecting to get something out of it. This section of Scripture of the Beatitudes is the very beginning of Jesus' most famous sermon, which was the Sermon on the Mount. And that's what we gave it that title. Jesus didn't say, this is my Sermon on the Mount. No, we've given that, it that title. This sermon is the most extensive, the, mo the longest sermon we have in Scripture from Jesus. If you were to read this, script, this uh, sermon through in, in the account in Matthew, which is where we're going to be reading from today, it would take about seven minutes to read through it. Now, this was not the length of Jesus' sermon. Most likely, this is like the cliff notes, okay, of Jesus' sermon. Matthew wrote them in his account of the gospel, and it's kind of the cliff notes of what Jesus was preaching. Most likely, Jesus preached a long sermon, possibly an hour or more, to the people. The reason being was because they were traveling, some of them, days to hear him speak, to hear him teach. Now, for us to travel today to a conference, no big deal, right? Jump in our cars or jump on a plane. But in this day, for them to travel a day or two to hear Jesus speak, that was a big deal. Because not only do you have to make that walk, but then you have to make that walk back. And having food and all these sorts of things was a lot more difficult in this day and age as well. So these people, it says that a multitude, and we're going to read it, came to hear him speak. It was, a multi it was thousands of people that came from all over the region to hear Jesus give this sermon. This is, again, one of the most important sermons we have from Jesus' life and from Jesus' ministry. They went expecting. They went with an expectation that they were, they were going to hear something that would be life-changing, and Jesus never disappointed, did he? And he still doesn't disappoint us today. Jesus is a life-changing person. He is a life-changing person. God. He is the Son of God, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords. Now, the Beatitudes represented and presented a new set of Christian ideals that focus on a spirit of love and humility. Now, in this day and age, just like our culture, in the, in the culture of this time, um, the, it was very contrary, Jesus' teaching was very contrary to what the culture was saying to them. I mean, they were under Roman rule. It was all about what you could get. It was all about force uh, it was all about taking care of yourself. And then Jesus comes in and says, this is how you're to live, humbly and lovingly. What, what are the two greatest commandments Jesus gave us, right? 
to love the Lord your God. So you're here to love God first and then to love your neighbor as yourself, to love others second. So Jesus came and said, I'm going to change the context of, of what your culture is telling you. And it's time to live differently. It's time to leave, live in humility. It's time to live in love. This presents a shift in how people were called to live, to react to life and situations, exemplifying everything that Jesus was calling people to. So these eight Beatitudes, I believe, are crucial to our lives as Christians. And as we go through them, you're probably going to realize I do not exemplify a lot of these Beatitudes. I don't exemplify a lot of these attitudes in my life. It's not something I'm doing or being, and this is This, although, is how Jesus wants us to do and to be and to live. And so we need to apply these, we need to use these, and we need to walk these out each and every day. Now, as a pastor, you know, I've done uh, student ministry, college ministry. Uh, I've worked a lot with college students. You know, Christy and I held a small group at our house when we were in on the East Coast living in Massachusetts. Uh, go Red Sox. And, uh, and, and uh, I'm, I'm a bandwagon fan, okay? I'll just be honest. So um, they're in the World Series now, so I'm a Red Sox fan. Um, but when we lived there, we, we ministered to college students a lot. And one question I would get from college students, and I, you know, I would talk to a lot of people who didn't necessarily believe in God or church or Jesus. Um, this was the biggest statement or question that I would get, and you guys have all probably heard this. This is what people would say to me all the time. Isn't Christianity just a crutch for people who can't make it on their own? Isn't Christianity just a crutch for the weak. And I would hear that all the time. And for, and you, you've probably heard this, right? Most of you, I'm guessing. And for a while there, I would try to like argue that it wasn't. And I would try to convince them why it wasn't for weak mind. And then I came to a realization like recently. When people say this to me, when they ask me this, you know what I say? Yes, absolutely. For some reason, we see, we've, in our, right now, we think of a crutch as a bad thing, but have any of you ever been injured or had a, something going on where you needed a crutch? A crutch is not a bad thing. A crutch is a good thing. It helps you. It helps you get where you need to go when you have a weakness and uh, an affliction, something going on in your life. So I'm going to back this up with scripture, okay? Mark 2, 17. Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. You see, Jesus came for those of us that were in need of a Savior. And let me tell you something. We all are in need of a Savior. So when people say, it's just a crutch, I go, yes, it is. And you need that crutch too. And I need that crutch. All of humanity needs that crutch. Why? Because we are destined for death because of our sin. But because of Jesus, he came, and his life gave us life. And so we need it. We need that crutch. So don't argue with people, oh, yeah, it's not a crutch. Just tell them, yeah, it is. And you need that crutch too. And I need that crutch. We all need that crutch. All of humanity needs that crutch. So don't fight it. Embrace it. Walk in that. All right, let's read Matthew chapter 5, verse 1 through 4. We're going to start in the ESV. And then I'm going to read it in the message. It says this. Seeing the crowds, so crowds, multitudes, there were thousands of people. This is the Sermon on the Mount. He went up on the mountain. And when he, that's why we call it the Sermon on the Mount, because he's on a mountain. Get it? Okay. And when he sat down, his disciples came to him. And he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn. For they shall be comforted. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for this day. Thank you for your word. I pray that we would be challenged by it. We would be moved by it. We would uh, apply it to our lives and we would leave here differently. May we live out these beatitudes. May we walk these and, and have these as a part of us every single day, not just when we feel like it, but every day of our lives. And Jesus, I pray that you would help the 49ers defeat the Titans soundly embarrassingly. And Lord, just help the Raiders to do something. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. The Raiders need more prayer than the 49ers. Just want to let you know. Um, I, I saw, sad to say, but your pastor is a 49ers fan, so it's going to be all about the Niners here, okay? So let's read uh, Matthew 5, 3, 3 and 4 in the message. 
says this, you're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there is more of God and his rule. You're blessed when you feel you've lost what is most dear to you. Only then can you be embraced by the one most dear to you. And I like how the message puts it in just contemporary terms. But I want to start here by defining these beatitudes and defining what blessed means. Because sometimes, you know, we, we have this, this thing that Jesus does here. And he said, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. But what does blessed mean? So let me, let me define this for you. I'm going to throw it on the screen. Um, this is kind of something I came up with uh, through some study. So blessed meaning a pledge of divine reward for the inner spiritual character of the righteous. In other ways, it is Jesus' description of the spiritual attitude and state of people who are right with God. Jesus doesn't say, happy are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He doesn't say, happy are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted for a reason. You see, happiness is temporary, but blessedness is eternal. What Jesus was doing was he was redefining citizenship. And so how does he start these beatitudes? The first beatitude, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What he was saying is you're not a citizen of this world. You're not a citizen of Galilee or Israel or the United States of America. Wow, we are citizens here, and I'm all for it, right? USA. I love our nation. But at the end of the day, we are not citizens. When, when this life ends, you are not going to be a citizen of America any longer. You will be either a citizen of the kingdom of God or not. And that's why we need to live these attitudes out. Each beatitude is a present assurance with a future promise. So, it starts with, blessed are the poor in spirit. Present assurance. For theirs, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Future promise. Blessed are those who mourn. Present assurance. For they shall be comforted. Future assurance. So we have these beatitudes and Jesus did them in a way that showed what is happening now and what will happen in the future. And that's why they're so important and crucial and vital that we live them out each and every day. The Beatitudes contain an implicit invitation to become this kind of person. Jesus wants you to become this kind of person. Jesus wants me to become this kind of person. He wanted the people of that day to become this kind of person. And so he laid out these eight attitudes that they're supposed to live out, and we need to live them out today. So I'm excited to go through these eight with you. We're going to start with the first two. And I want to start by talking about poor in spirit. Poor in spirit could be replaced by one word, humility. Everybody say humility. Poor in spirit could be replaced by this word of humility because being poor in spirit means that you are humble. It means you don't associate with those that are high, but you associate with the low. It means you choose to put others ahead of yourselves. Now, when I was uh, growing up, I was a 49ers fan, as I told you, and I love Terrell Owens, all right, T.O. T.O. was, but let me tell you something about T.O. The man was arrogant, right? So I was watching a special on the 49ers one day, and they had, like the, he, they had him mic'd up and all the background on Terrell Owens. And so I'm watching this special, and the entire game, Terrell Owens is mic'd. This is what he's saying. I love me. I love me some me. I love me. I love me some me. He's walking up and down the sidelines. I love me. I love me some me. And then he starts, because they're at an away, it was an away game, and he starts yelling, they love to hate me, right? You love to hate me. They love to hate me. But I love me. I love me some me. And he was all about T.O., wasn't he? All about T.O., all about himself. And that's the culture we live in, isn't it? This society, this culture is telling us that we should be all about ourselves, all about what we can get, how we can get further along, what we can achieve, all the blessings we can get personally. But Jesus came and said, no, it's about what you can do for others. It's about humility. It's about serving. It's about serving the people around you. 
And that's what Jesus did. He just flipped culture upside down. And he's still doing it for us today because culture has not changed. Some people think, oh, it was so different back then. Well, yeah, they didn't have iPads and internet and cars and all these sorts of things. But the what was going on in life and the people, people are people, man. It doesn't matter if you have a car or you're riding on a horse. We all have the same issues, don't we? Pride being the first one. I mean, what was the first sin we see, really? Satan, when he falls, it was all based in pride. I believe that all sin begins with pride. All sin starts with pride. Fear, rooted in pride. Insecurity, rooted in pride. Selfishness, pride. It all starts with pride. Satan thought he was as good as God. He thought he was as talented and a gifted ability. And he, he, look how beautiful I am and all the skills I have. I, and he considered equality with God and he fell because of it. Pride is, it's almost ingrained into us as human beings. And so Jesus came and said, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the humble. And he was saying, it's time to change the way you've been living. It's time to change your mindset. So here's what I want to do today. I want to read from Matthew chapter 15 the story of the Canaanite woman. And I'm going to share with you four ways that this woman exemplified what it meant to be poor in spirit. And then at the very end, I'm going to talk about blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. But let's read this account where this Canaanite woman comes to see Jesus. Starting in Matthew chapter 15, verse 21, it'll be on the screen for you. And Jesus went away from there and withdrew to the district of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a Canaanite woman from that region came out and was crying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely oppressed by a demon. But he did not answer her a word. And his disciples came and begged him, saying, Send her away, for she is crying out after us. He answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But she came and knelt before him, saying, Lord, help me. And he answered, It is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, Yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, O woman, great is your faith. Be it done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed instantly. This woman exemplified what it meant to be poor in spirit. The first way she exemplified it was she recognized how great Jesus was. Today and every day, this church is all about Jesus. All about Jesus. This woman recognized how great Jesus was, and we need to recognize how great Jesus is. You and I, we need to recognize how great he is. How amazing he is. Verse 22, it says, she cried out, have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is oppressed by a demon. She recognized how great Jesus was. She recognized who he was, that he was the son of God, that he was the king of kings. That he was the Lord of Lords. We live in a culture that would try to say that Jesus was a good teacher. That Jesus, he was a good teacher. Maybe, maybe a prophet. He, he gave a, a lot of great Christian ideals. But what this culture doesn't realize and what we have to recognize is how great Jesus is. You see, he wasn't just a good teacher. He was God himself in the flesh. Came down to this earth to save you and I. This woman recognized how great Jesus was. And you and I have to recognize how great he is. He's the author and the finisher of our faith, Scripture tells us. He's all we need, Jesus. We must be a people who recognize the greatness of our God, the greatness of our Savior, that he came down in the form of a baby initially, and grew into a man, and died on the cross for us. This woman recognized how great Jesus was. Second, she recognized how desperately she needed Jesus. 
We have to recognize how desperately we need Jesus today. And let me tell you something. You desperately need him. I desperately need him. The second part of of verse 22, she says, my daughter is oppressed. My daughter is in need of you, Jesus. How desperately we need him. You and I are in desperate need of him. The world would try to say that he's a crutch. The world would try to say that he is a great teacher. But we have to recognize how much we need Jesus in our lives. You know, uh, and I'm just going to be honest with you. Every Sunday I think I confess things to you guys. I hope that's okay. Every Saturday night I get depressed. Just letting you guys know. Every Saturday night. I get depressed. Let me tell you why. I read through my message, go over it, make sure that it, it's exactly how I want it to be. And then I finish, I close my Bible, I close my notes, and I have this moment with God. And you know what usually comes in? Doubt, fear, insecurity. So every Saturday night I get depressed and I say, God, I, I'm not, I don't have anything to give. I'm not that talented. I'm not that gifted. I'm not that smart. I'm not spiritual enough. I don't pray enough. I don't read my Bible enough. I'm just a guy. And I have to go up there tomorrow and try to share from your word. And, I'm, and, and every week, I mean, Saturday night, I literally, Saturday night, get depressed and I go to sleep. And every time, though, as I'm getting ready to close my eyes and I'm having these thoughts and these feelings of insecurity and inadequacy, you know what Jesus says to me and whispers to me and tells me? He says, just tell him about me. Just tell him about Jesus. Just tell him who I am. Just tell him what I've done. Just tell him what my word says. Because it doesn't matter about me. I don't have to be the most talented, the most gifted, the most eloquent. All that matters is him. And I realize every Sunday morning I wake up and that, de- that depression is gone, right? And there's faith and joy because I say, you know what? I'm going to get up there. It's not me. It's him. I desperately need him. So, Jesus, you speak. I'm going to tell him about you and you will touch people's hearts. That's what, Je- that's what Jesus said. He, he said he was going to send the Holy Spirit to us. Because he would be the one to convict us of our sin. It's not my job to convict you. My job is to tell you about Jesus. Tell you what his word says and let him touch your heart. We have to realize how desperately we need him. We are sinners. You know, for some reason, church people, we got a problem in the church. You guys know that, right? The church has a problem. We think we're really holy, don't we? And we come in, you know, on Sunday mornings, and we're, I'm spiritual, right? I don't know why spiritual people always pull up their pants, though. They just do, okay? I'm holy. I'm spiritual. I got this. And we start to think we're something special. We start to think we're really holy. We're really righteous. It doesn't matter if you're the worst sinner in this room or the least sinner in this room. If you've done the most sins in this room or the least amount of sins in this room, we all desperately need Jesus because all it takes is one sin to separate us from God. And the only one that can bridge that divide is Jesus. We desperately need him. And this woman, the Canaanite woman, she realized this. She was poor in spirit. She was humble. Third, she recognized how unworthy she was before Jesus. Verse 27, and this is kind of like, super controversial, this passage, and it's not something I've ever actually ever heard preached. But in verse number 27, actually we'll start in verse 26. He answered to her, it is not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. Verse 24 He answers her and says, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. You see, Jesus came on mission to minister to the Israelites, first and foremost. 
and then he told them to take his message and spread it to the whole world. But he knew he had to start with Israel. So whenever people like, I've had people get mad at me about our church. They're like, your church is too geared towards the younger generation. Jesus was all inclusive, right? And, and you're focused on a younger generation. That's wrong. You need to present something that's for everyone. And I say, hey, Jesus is for everyone. But Jesus knew he had a specific task. He had a small amount of time. So he came with a focus. So I don't apologize. I say, yeah, we're going to gear this church towards the younger generation. And we have older people that come and love it. And I tell them, if it's too loud, just put in some earplugs, right? I'm down with that. I, most Sunday mornings, I want to put earplugs in myself. But Jesus came. He had a specific mission, a specific people group that he was going to reach. And then, I mean, he had three years of ministry. And then the message went to the whole world. Yes, Jesus is all-inclusive, but we can't apologize for who God's calling us to. Anyways, that wasn't in my notes. That was just on the side. That was a little extra nugget for you today. But she recognized how unworthy she was before Jesus. What does Jesus call her? He calls her a dog. Man, you guys are like, I thought Jesus was more loving than that. He calls, he, I mean, it's an illustration he's using here, right? But he equates her to a dog. He says, it's not right for the master to take bread and throw it to the dogs. I came for, to minister to the Israelites. You're a woman from Canaan. I'm sorry. You know what she could have done in that instance and what most of us would have done? This is what we would have done. But Jesus, I'm pretty gifted. I'm pretty smart. I'm pretty talented. I'm from Canaan. I'm rich, okay? I got this or that going for me. I mean, you really should do this for me, Jesus. I'd be a good person to have on your team. That's what most of us would have done. We would have tried to convince Jesus of all the good things we have and all the gift things we have so that he would help me help us and then put us on his team but that's not what she does what does she do she embraces her unworthiness before Jesus and she says even the dogs eat the crumbs from the master's table she says I'll take the crumbs Jesus I'll take the crumbs I don't need the bread. Just give me the crumbs. That's good enough. She recognized her unworthiness before him. And we need to recognize our unworthiness before him. Stop pulling up your britches, thinking you're holy or spiritual. I read my Bible a lot, though, Caleb. It doesn't matter. We're all unworthy because we're all sinful, we're all broken. None of us deserve his love, but he gave it to us anyways. And when we're poor in spirit, we recognize that. And we humble ourselves. Before, If I got up here in pride and arrogance and shared what I, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to rock these people's world this Sunday morning, I can guarantee you it would not go well. So I'm so glad every Saturday night I get depressed. I'm so glad every Saturday night I feel like I got nothing to give. You want to know why? Because that's when I realize how great God is and how little I am. And I said, God, I'm unworthy. I mean, there's a lot of times I stand before you and I'm like, man, this week I didn't do, I did not live right, man. I was rude to my wife. I yelled at my kids, right? Somebody asked me for help and I ignored them. And I stand up here as a sinful, broken person, just like all of you, unworthy before Jesus. And I speak to you out of that. But the thing is, it's not me. It's him. So when I wake up on Sunday, I say, Jesus, you speak to them. I'm going to tell them who you are. I'm going to share with them your love. I'm going to share with them what you've done for them, how much you, you love them, and the plan you have for their life, and I'll leave it to you. That's what God's looking for, of people who would not consider equality with God. That's what Scripture says about Jesus. He didn't consider equality with God, but he humbled himself like a servant, even unto death. Jesus, the servant of all. Jesus, the most poor in spirit of all, has called us to be poor in spirit, to be humble, to not consider ourselves equal with God, to understand our unworthiness, but to see that he loves us despite how unworthy we are. 
And then I want to close. The fourth, fourth way this woman exemplified what it meant to be poor in spirit is she recognized healing and comfort came through Jesus. In verse number 28, Jesus says, how great is your faith? Be it done for you as you desire. And that day, her daughter was healed. It says instantly, her daughter was healed. We have to recognize today where our healing comes from, where our comfort comes from, which connects to the second beatitude. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. I know in a room this large, many of you have gone through challenging, hurtful, painful times in your life. You understand what it means to mourn. You know, I didn't understand what it meant to mourn until about a year and a half ago when I lost my grandfather, who I shared with you last Sunday, who was my closest, one of my closest friends, my mentor, my guide, my hero. I lost him, and for the first time in my life, I understood what it meant to mourn. But I also understood what it meant to be comforted by Jesus, to be comforted by his love. And I know there's people in here, you've been hurt, you've been stabbed in the back in a relationship, you've been betrayed, you've lost children, you've been betrayed by children, you've had friends go behind your back, you've lost people close to you, loved ones have died. You understand in this room what it means to mourn, but when you know Jesus, you also understand what it means to be comforted. So when Jesus said, blessed are those who mourn, what he was saying was, mourning is a part of life. You live on this earth, so you will mourn. You live on this earth, so you will be in pain, but I will comfort you. My spirit will comfort you. All you have to do is just put your faith in me and your trust in me and recognize my love. God is a God of comfort. He wants to comfort you in your pain, in your struggles. Some of you are at the bottom right now, man. You're, at, you're on the lowest level. You're hurting. God wants to comfort you in loss, in pain, in hurt. That's what he does. You're blessed when you mourn. I know it's not easy to say it. It's easy for me to say that, actually. It's hard for me to live that out. But when you put your faith in God, when you mourn, you'll be comforted. I want to go back. Last thing I'm going to share with you, and then we're going to go. Matthew 15, the story of the Canaanite woman. He answered her, Jesus, it's not right to take the children's bread and throw it to the dogs. She said, yes, Lord, even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. You know, I've read this story a lot of times in this, this section right here. This response that she had, it hit me harder this week than ever before in my life. This is what it says to us. The crumbs from the master's table are a greater blessing than anything you could ever get from this world. The crumbs from the master's table are more than enough for us. The crumbs from the master are the greatest thing we could ever get when it comes to this world. But I was thinking about that this week, and she was happy with the crumbs. She said, I'll take the crumbs. Even the dogs eat the crumbs from the master's table. I'll take them. And Jesus said, great is your faith. Your daughter will be healed right now. And she was healed instantly. But here's the thing. God loves us so much that he didn't give us the crumbs. He gave us his son. That's how much God loves you. That's how much he loves me. That's how much he loves this world. That he, was, he said, yeah, the crumbs are more than enough. 
but I'm not going to just give you the crumbs. I'm not going to just give you the leftovers. I'm going to give you the first. I'm going to give you my son. I'm going to give you Jesus, and I'm going to send him down to you to die on that cross so that you could be forgiven, so that you could be washed clean, so you could have life and life more abundantly, so you could have life and life to the fullest. That's the God that we serve. He's not a God that gives crumbs. He's a God that gives his son. He's not a God that gives us the leftovers. He's a God that gives us the first fruits. That's who we serve. That's the God that I'm talking to you about today. Not a God of leftovers. A God of first fruits. A God that loved you so much that he said, here's my son. I'll lay him down for you, for this world, so that we could all live. So we would not receive death, which we deserve, but we would receive life, which he promised. Is there any greater message out there? Is there any, any greater story out there? God loves you so much. He gave you the first, not the leftovers. He created you. He formed you in your mother's womb. He sees you. He knows the amount of hairs on your head. And he has great things in store for your life. Would you bow your heads with me all across this place?